Welcome to this Times Techies webinar. I am Sujit John, and I have with me my colleague Akhil George. The two of us will moderate this discussion, which we are having in association with Capgemini. Today happens to be the fifth anniversary of Times Techies. We started the page in the Times of India on June 12th, 2019. So it's a very special day for us. Uh, today with Capgemini and two other panelists, we are going to discuss the exciting area of how automotive engineering is dramatically changing with software. Cars are now being called computers on wheels. The dumb car is becoming, as they say, increasingly intelligent. Consumers today view automobiles as more than just a means of transport. They expect innovative features and services in their cars, such as advanced driver assistance, immersive infotainment, and connectivity. AI is making the space even more exciting. All of this also means youngsters looking to get into automotive engineering need to now think differently. They need to think digital. They need to think design. And to discuss all this, we have three experts in the space. We have Dr. Mohit Dube. Dr. Mohit is the Pro Vice Chancellor at MIT ADT University, Pune. He's also the CEO of Atal Incubation Center at the university. The center is a not-for-profit company supported by Atal Innovation Mission, Niti Aayog, and the Government of India to promote innovation and entrepreneurship across the country. Dr. Mohit has led the incubator to be among the best incubators of the Atal Innovation Mission Network. He established strong processes and a network of mentors, advisors to support over 65 startups in the last five years. Prior to joining MIT ADT University, Dr. Mohit was Pro Vice Chancellor at IFTM University, Moradabad. And prior to his educational stint, he had over a decade of experience in the IT industry, including at Infosys. Wow. Welcome, Dr. Mohit. We have Nishit Jain. Nishit is Associate Vice President and Head of Future Mobility and Digital Services at Daimler India Commercial Vehicles. He has over two decades, he has over two decades of hands-on experience in vehicle and ecosystem development. He began his career at Maruti Suzuki India, where he worked on various initiatives in vehicle powertrain and mechatronics. He also led the launch of the Suzuki Connect, a unique telematics offering for passenger cars. He then transitioned to Honor Electric, where he played a pivotal role in bringing new concepts and implementing ideas to drive innovation in the e-mobility landscape. Nishit has five patents to his name, along with several publications in SAE. Uh, which is the Global Standards Development and Profo uh, Professional Association of Mobility Engineers. Uh, welcome, Nishir. And we have Anurag Bharadwaj. Anurag is the industry platform leader for automotive at Capgemini in India. In this, he provides thought leadership to the automotive industry and predicts and deciphers new trends unfolding in the industry. He defines strategy for the industry and scales up strategy execution. Nirag is a digital transformation leader with 25 years of sales and delivery experience in industrial, automotive, and distribution sectors. Prior to Capgemini, he was with IBM for many years. He has worked with European, US, Japanese, East Asian, African, and Indian clients. He has delivered cutting-edge solutions like, uh, the connect like the connected car from Alta Suzuki, uh, India, and Honda cars, among others. Welcome, Nirag. Thank you. Those who are viewing this can send in questions to the Facebook comment box. Sujit and I will put them to Dr. Mohit, Nishit, and Anurag. So why don't we just jump straight into the webinar? Um, Anurag, uh, uh, the first question is for you. Uh, from creating marvels of mechanical engineering to now computers on wheels, uh, automotive engineering has witnessed transformation like no other. Can you give a little background on this evolution and why the industry was well-placed for this change? Okay, the, the point is, I look at it an automotive masterpiece is real piece of engineering and we put our lives into it. So there are more complex pieces of engineering you can see which exist, but not the ordinary person drives or uses it. And hence in automotive, the sense of responsibility, complexity, and the standards go that high because an aeroplane is piloted by a specialist. 
a train is piloted by an specialist a rocket is fired by a scientist but automobile even a 10 even a no, uneducated is driving that so we have to look for safety we have to look for security we have to look for everything now what is happening with the advent of technologies if you look at it at an automobile even a simplest vehicle right it has hundreds of ecus electronic uh, control units into it they are constantly exchanging data with each other and there are different architectures and others are emerging so i'm not going into that what is happening is this is making an earlier it was only a mechanical device which was mm. running which we didn't had any control which was not deciding because it was executing now with the ecus we are getting the feedback we know we are sending the uh, the instructions what is to happen in response to that action uh, that is happening on the wheel on the suspension in the engine with the cylinders right so what happened as we are moving more compute technology is compute power is available at a cheaper rate our chips are becoming stronger we are putting more and more so you more and more power inside the car inside the vehicle so you see our display units are enlarging earlier 4 to 6 inch of display unit was like luxury now 12 inches 18 inches multiple such display unit what is taking place because compute power is available because display technology is 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 becoming economical i would not say cheaper and more efficient right we can exchange data now the vehicle is no longer limited to its boundary physical boundary of the vehicle it has extended personality beyond itself you can access your vehicle from your mobile you can access your vehicle from your web uh, web browser you can switch it on you can switch it off you can switch on the ac you can do lot of things with your vehicle sitting in your uh, drawing room if you are your car is parked say in a sunny day in india and it's getting heated up and you don't want to go through the discomfort of sitting in that hot car 15 minutes before you can switch on your car you can switch on your ac and by the time you are in the car it's perfectly the temperature the climb that you want so this is all is possible with advent of the capacity the evolution that is happening in other technologies like the compute power like the digital communication like the chip evol evolution so this is how the the, the a pure mechanical product is now electro mechanical or more i would say even beyond electro <laughs> electronic mechanical and more yeah. and more people are saying it would be less mechanical and more computer and ele electronics into it so yeah the percentage that you can give how much now is it software and electronics uh, uh, compared to mechanical and what do you where do you see that going so uh, software component right now in a in not in terms of number uh, in terms of overall cost if i say and that will give you a sense 30% of the cost goes into the electronics that dimensions of the car now so you see and it is going and what 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 uh, uh, the oems original equipment manufacturers like maruti suzuki or honda or toyota all these people what they are talking about they want 30% of their revenue coming from the digital services so mm -hmm. there is there is a big push towards it that it's not just the physical boundaries or the physical mechanical vehicle that you are driving we are moving towards mobility we are moving towards experience we are moving through car is my happy space vehicle is my happy space where i spend lot of time and i spend most important and critical time either i am going for walk in the morning or i am coming back from the work where i want to be relaxed i don't want to get irritated while i am going to office i want to be peaceful while i am coming home when i am dropping my kids i want a very safe and comfortable environment where i can chit chat with them when i am taking the patient to the hospital 
I need a secure and safe environment which is not jumping and juggling around. Suspension, everything else. So all these complex dimensions, all this is possible because of electronics and electronics is increasing day by day. Fascinating. Uh, Nishit, uh, tell us, I mean, this software-driven automobile trend, uh, how does it change the core processes of automotive design and manufacture? Yeah, and, and first of all, thank you, Anuradji, so for setting this up. I think uh, you have uh, very correctly mentioned about the whole ecosystem which is there. So, uh, with respect to the automobile, see, it's not only, as Anuradji mentioned, it's not only about the product, or it's not only about the core of uh, something. Uh, it's it's beyond that. So you you so nowadays it's not only we are talking about the car, but also the peripheral. So peripheral involves all the ecosystem, which is for example the hardware itself. So you have a lot of hardware which is available right now, the computing power. So all enablers are there. Uh, the infrastructure is there. So we talk about our national highways, uh, the, the the growing every speed, all those things we talk about, right? And in terms of the, the the manufacturing itself or the core process itself, the, the, the whole concept of design has changed over the years. So it's not only about the physical product, what we used to you know uh, uh, make from our hands and uh, do something, assemble something. Uh, it's more of a simulation nowadays. So before even you go to the proto, or before even you start manufacturing something physically, you will, would like to actually, first of all, see a simulation part of it. And there, that's that's where your journey starts, and that's where the software uh, keeps comes very handy. So you start from a simulation, you start from your visualization, you start from that abstraction and converting it to something which you can visualize and see. And that's where the journey starts, and uh, that's where the, the software plays a very important role. And and what it leads to is a huge improvement in the processes. So so instead of wasting time or instead of uh, spending time on making the prototype. You actually first design, you do all the mistakes, you do all the corrections in the virtual level itself. So that saves a lot of time in terms of development. So it, earlier, for example, typical automobile will uh, take, let's say, four years or something for, for from start to end. Now this all all this uh, times, the development time has reduced uh, quite quite dramatically. So how much? It, it takes around 20 months. Yeah. probably. So it's a mature product you can expect in 20 months itself. With mm -hmm. use of all these software and simulations. So that's how the industry is moving. And it's not only about the product or the design itself. It's also of the operation. You talk about digital twins. You're talking about the plant itself. The plant setup, you can actually visualize how the assembly will be done. How you know a worker will actually access the components. How they will assemble it. And how they're going to, you know, whether they're going to face any challenge or not. So all these things are actually helping us in correcting our uh, mistakes or our, uh, you know, improving our designs, bringing more expansion to it, so that the final product, when we actually start developing it over over the line or on the assembly line, it is really good. So that's where all these optimizations are helping. Uh, so 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 it's not only about the design part. So it's on it's not only about the design part of the automobile, but also the peripheral. What what uh, is involved? Given an estimation of the uh, efficiency improvement that you had had so far. With all the software, see as I said, like so, development time earlier it's a it, it used to take four years, right? Four years is down. So now, so you can expect something in uh, maybe less than two years in in some cases, mm -hmm. or maybe it's a very different case, a very complex case. Then it can go to three years, not more than that. But it's all it's all helping, and factory plus you are also seeing a lot of sorry factory efficiency with this digital twins and all that. How much has it gone up by? See, uh, it's very difficult to put a figure, but depends on company to company. But uh, you can definitely at least see an improvement 20 to 30 percent because see, you are removing a lot of overheads. See, you're not impacting the line operation. For example, if I have a current line which is running, you're not stopping it actually for making your prototypes, right? So, so the the moment you start making prototype, you start doing the trials. You are actually impacting all the operations also because a lot of manpower, a lot of you know the support system is actually involved in getting the product right. So all these things, if you are able to handle virtually, then then before even going to the line or operations, it's it's bringing a lot of efficiency and in, and also the cost reductions. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mohit, maybe you can uh, jump in here. Maybe you can tell us what are some use cases in driving the software has made possible now that hardware and existing automotive hardware, hardware technology could not have achieved? Thanks, uh, Akhil. First of all, uh, uh, to both uh, Sujit ji, Akhil, 
and to the entire Times of India family, I wish you, uh, you, you say it's the fifth anniversary. I wish that we conduct this kind of a seminar when you are celebrating 50th anniversary and the 500th anniversary. <laughs> I'm, Thank I'm pretty you sure, so much. Uh, Thank you it, so it alludes much. to the question as well, because as, as we know that the technology has been evolving, so our, our, our discussions around how do we enable people to look at, embrace these technological evolution, you know, that, that also takes a lot of uh, precedence. And how do you do this? Do you, you do this by holding these kind of seminars, uh, you know, enabling sessions with people so that, uh, first of all, the dissemination of this information goes out, right? And I think I'd like to thank my uh, previous speakers about setting the context right with regards to the evolution that has happened, right? I'll tell you a few uh, things before I jump onto the use cases. As we move from the the, the hardware-driven uh, product, which is the automobile or the transportation overall, you know, uh, and, and bake in the technology layers, you know, it, it brings a lot of uh, complexities in the overall schema of things. For example, um, if you want to design an automobile or if you want to design a, a transportation vehicle, right, uh, can you use the technology? Yes, there are a lot of uh, tools that are coming up, right? With the advent of Gen AI, uh, uh, how can you, uh, you know, uh, do the future proofing of the cars? How do you generate the design uh, which would be accepted by the market, right? So that's one use case where you want to uh, deploy technology for, uh, uh, you know, uh, reduc reducing the time of designing the new vehicles, right? And when Gen you AI, want to- Gen AI can also be used there. Uh, we, we did a, a exercise with, uh, uh, you know, Capgemini where, uh, we we did a, a, a future prediction of the new age uh, uh, designs of the transportation vehicle, not just the uh, cars, but it was whole sort of uh, you know new age uh, 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 vehicles uh, using the Gen AI as as uh, one piece of the technology, right? So it reduces the time of how do you create the design. Uh, essentially, uh, when you apply the design principles in in creating these things, right? How do you make it more personalized? As I think uh, Anuragji was mentioning about, it's 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 an extension of my persona, right? So I have to think in, can I personalize this whole element at the time of designing itself, right? Uh, how do you, for example, all of us have seen these ho ho buses when we go on to, you know, these uh, uh, foreign tours, it's Paris, Dubai, and all of that, you know, uh, in, in, for example, if we are hosting uh, an Olympic game in 2036, for example, right, Olympic games, so can I drive these buses, which would carry these uh, uh, passengers or the players? So let's say if they are driving around in Pune, right? And if the bus go across Shaniwar Vada, can my screens, can they lit up and become the augmented reality part of it where they can come to know about, oh, this is Shaniwar Vada, you know, the, 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 the de details and the information gets thrown up on the screen. By the way, it's it's also acts as a glass. So you can actually see through the window, but when, you are crossing some of the milestones, you know, it just pops up with a lot of information, right? So how do you design those kind of experiences, right? So there's some work that our design school is kind of doing it. The, the kids are trying to do some of that thing uh, in that space. So, so that's one piece of the designing elements. How do you personalize that? How do you create that, uh, you know, new forms of design? For example, there are no differences in the design the cars are being made or the automobiles are made uh, between if I want to create a, a car for, a person with uh, disability, or if there is a, a car that needs to uh, uh, be customized as far as when women were, is driving, right? So the different persona of drivers, the different users who are going to use, right? So that is where your design thinking process of creating the products with customer at the core of it, right? That's how you start drive, driving a lot of these, uh, you know, design products. As far as technology is concerned, I think you mentioned about the uh, software being added, right? It's more of a software. Uh, uh, a solution than the, really the hardware, right? W what complexities do we see? When you bring in a lot of these softwares, right? The first and the foremost component that I feel, uh, having worked in the banking and the financial industry is the, the security part, right? Uh, how do you build these on an India stack? The, the, the solutions that we are kind of building, if they are proprietary, we are again going to be dependent upon some solutions on the software side, which is either going to come from Germany, US, Israel, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, can we create the UPI uh, generation? Can we create the ONDC systems? Can we create the Aadhaar based systems, which is essentially the India stack? So do we have our India stack of software, which can be used as, you know, the, the digital public infrastructure, if I were to use that word, 
which is the foundational building blocks of building all the softwares that would uh, sit on top of these foundational blocks, right? So uh, that gives us the edge of uh, uh, controlling the entire software uh, value chain, right? Do we write uh, our own operating systems, right? Uh, okay. From India, which cannot be hacked elsewhere. Because there are a lot of cybersecurity elements that start creeping in, right? Uh, uh, if I'm driving a car, uh, if, if it can be remotely hacked, it can you know spell disasters. So unless until we, I control the entire value chain of my software, I would not have a lot of confidence in the software that I'm building on top of my hardware, right? Uh, onto the use cases part that you asked specifically, as I mentioned, one is the uh, you know reduction in the time of designing our own cards. When you want to personalize some of those elements, whether it's infotainment, whether it's you know giving my color combination of my cards, because you know if I can use LED lights, it as soon as I uh, get in, I'm just taking that example of uh, Aragji when he said, I want to drive to my office. So I need a soothing effect in my car, right? It should turn on based on my mood. When I'm coming back, it, it needs to realize, it needs to preempt my mood. What is my normal habit of listening to, uh, you know, Radio FM or whatever, right? So can it play that kind of a music? So I think uh, there are a lot of opportunities that are coming in. Second use case, I would say, with a lot of traffic congestion that is happening, uh, there's already a startup which is working in IIT Chennai, it's e-plane company, right? Can we start looking at flying cars, which are, you know, very personalized? Can it be my own vehicle instead of like two wheelers on the road? Can it be one to two passenger e-flying taxis, e-flying cars kind of a thing? Uh, all of us are struggling with the traffic jams, right? So can that be a solution? Uh, we are looking at another uh, case, which, which is being tested as we speak right now, is about the fast commute at IIT Chennai for the Hyperloop, right? Mm. They're trying to build that piece. In, in practical scenario on Ahmedabad Mumbai corridor, they are trying to experiment with this uh, high speed rail, right? So all of this will need a lot of technology to be baked in uh, with regards to the hardware that is being built uh, right now. Uh, another important that we were working on uh, with um, one of the uh, automobile company was this, the entire um, um, navigation, the, the, the maps that you see on the screen, it speaks English, it only speaks English language. Right? And they said that if we can utilize the NLP as a technology, you know, and if I uh, uh, make the translation that the, the lady speaks or the, the voice speaks uh, to, to regional languages, right, the penetration of the cars would go multifolds in the rural areas. Right? If I say, ki wo, you know, if it says turn left, many people in the rural areas will not understand what is left. Right? So, Maharashtra may left, Kolak Bolenge, Tamil may Alag Bolenge, Hindi may Alag Bolenge, Bhojpuri may Alag Bolenge. How do you enable that interface of language conversion, language translation on the real time basis? Right? That drives the uh, penetration of these kind of uh, technologies or the products itself in the remote areas. Right? Uh, uh, another part is the decision making on the edge. Right? Uh, you, you mentioned about these being the connected uh, mobility solutions. Right? Uh, we, we said that initially in the in the uh, spaces where we can uh, you know transport the data to the remote locations the cloud servers can take the its own sweet time to come back these are edge computing right mm -hmm. so if i have to uh, venture into some autonomous uh, uh, you know uh, space uh, the the lot of decision making has to happen on the edge on the fly right there you know the lag time is pretty low right so you you have to build systems build solutions according to that so i think all these spaces, if you kind of start slicing down the overall value chain uh, of the entire uh, uh, mobility, right? Uh, I, I know there was a mention about the advanced chemistry uh, before, you know, all uh, live about how do you move from the EV side or the, you know, the lithium ion kind of thing to uh, uh, hydrogen, right? Where you also need to look for the sustainability side of it, right? Because the mining again is going to be a problem if we still create a new dependence on another material, on another mm -hmm. element, right? So how do you think through those layers? I think uh, uh, technology, when combined with software and hardware, uh, with a lot of design elements uh, and baking in these new age, you know, Gen AI is kind of a thing. I think the future looks very exciting. My only fear is that we are talking about this as a front end, as a market centricity, right? Uh, are, are we ready as universities? Are we ready as research institutions? Uh, are we ready as the polytechnics of this country to create the required manpower to even think through these, absorb these technologies and enable themselves 
So I'll talk about that in separate. Well, yeah, but I will come back to that a little later. Yeah. But absolutely, that's a very interesting topic that we need to cover uh, for messages to youngsters on what all this means for them. Uh, but before that, Anurag, you want to, uh, Anurag and Nishit, uh, you want to add to some of these AI use cases and all that are emerging now in automobiles? Yes. So quickly, Nishit, uh, with your permission. Uh, so what we have done is, is Chad GPT arrived in 2022 uh, uh, somewhere, and it is, uh, and we were made to think uh, what we will take a fresh look into automotive space. What can this generative AI, I'm focusing just on that, because normal AI we have been using, modeling and other things, digital training as Nishit uh, Span has talked about, Dr. Mohit has also talked about, but Gen AI. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Mohit has touched about it. So what we looked at it, this capability of this technology, Gen AI, which is bringing, it is applicable to which value stream of automotive. Everybody was trying, saying customer interaction is the easiest thing, chatbots and other aspects. We said, no, this technology is so powerful. There must be some use cases. It must be applicable. It should be able to influence my core processes. And when we, as an industry person, looked at those things, new product development or new product integrations, right? Like we say concept to launch kind of thing. That came like at the center of it. It says we are doing the market research. Uh, what what kind of product we need? We are having the people sentiment coming. It what kind of uh, uh, product they want? And then we say the market research. What is the white space or which is the ideal space for my product? What would be the ideal pricing on which I can launch my product? And what would be the shape and size that they are looking at? They are looking for a off-roader or a commuter or a family vehicle and what type would be the shape and size of it, right? And so all this, these are research intensive things. This is Gen AI is like the dream come true kind of a product or a tool in my hands and in my marketing and R&D teams, they can do wonders with it in less amount of time. They can, they can turn around things very fast and can have very realistic data with them. Then the next comes is, I have got the concept, I have got the price point. Now, I have got the expectation what my users or my consumers are looking at. How this vehicle will look, as Nishisan was talking about the production, the, 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 the product concept to launch from 48 months has come down to 24 months, 20, 24, 36 months, depending upon the complexity or the newness of the vehicle, this all has reduced. But the concept part, where I'm creating a clay model, that also has gone down. Why do I need to create a clay model in the first place? I can have it the rendition. And that is what we experimented with the, the esteemed faculty and the energetic students of MIT. So we gave them the concept, go and do the research, Go and find out your personas, define your personas, find out what kind of product your uh, people want, what the, what all you can have. And you know, we had around 10 teams working on it, parallel, because it was a competition, right? Uh, we showcased three teams in the final competition, different layers, and you know, when the finale happened, we had three 3D printed cars. I call it not 3D printing, uh, I call it baked the cards. So from <laughs> Owen, those three cards came up and we saw it, right? So amount and how much time we gave them, these students, almost less than two months. And they were doing their coursework. Along with their coursework, this was in competition. Extracurricular kind of thing as part of this. And they could turn it around, define that all this activity in less than two months. I mean, this was, and this is not hypothetical, Gen AI can do this, that. We thought about it. We put that idea. Students took it. Students are taking. They are exploring the tools at that point in time. Whether they have to do Figma, they have to do this, they have to do that, they have to do all that kind of things they are doing. And all this, they can do it in less than two, two and a half months. I mean, this is 
the the it is the <laughs> the fun of cake is in eating it tasting it and that mm. is what we tested that jane i can do wonder <laughs> okay absolutely and uh, i mean just to extend this uh, see i think that the trend has been changing a lot now so earlier the trend is product experience how a person will experience the product but now the trend is very clear trend is user expected experience if i expect something i should get it it's not that product is giving me something and i like it so the the whole game has changed actually so whole trend has changed now if you try to look at it in a deeper way so different scenarios will call for different uh, outcomes so for example if you are stuck in traffic probably then there your ambience and all that music etc will come uh, been helpful to you but if you are driving at a uh, on a national highway at a very high speed then what what will you expect you will expect some safety features to kick in you no know, anticipatory if there is some accident that is pre informed to the driver that okay there is some accident which is lying ahead you change your route or you drive slow or you drive cautiously right so all these things all these use cases are enabled through ai and the moment ai is able to you know predict what a user would expect the things become very uh, simpler because then you know that okay what is my users or consumers expectation in terms of the product right and how do i solve it how do i bring all these uh, interventions uh, while the con- consumer is using the product so and that is fully enabled through the use of software it's not that uh, you know only the product or the the hardware can help in th- these cases it's all the software which is going to change the industry which is going to change all these use cases how is it i mean as soon as the uh, if the vehicle finds that there's a, another vehicle within a certain distance or something it automatically starts a braking and all that is it yeah exactly so so two two things now so one is that even before that so so one is that uh, a, a vehicle is in front of you maybe let's say 100 meters away it stop fully you sense it through radar, radar and you then automatically apply the brake so that's that's one part of it the other part of it through this connectivity you are already have pre informed a control room that there is a accident which has happened or there is a vehicle which has stopped and that information is distributed much before even you enter into the space right so you are now talking about not only the vehicle not only the automobile you are also talking about the infrastructure so we call v2x right so vehicle to infrastructure and all those communications which are happening and 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 these are only can be enabled through software it's not that only hardware will play its role or only the product will play its role right but however it's not also so easy to implement because then you are also addressing the problems of consumer how the consumer is driving or how they are expecting the thing so it's it's a, it has to be a balanced approach how you are bringing all these things how you are displaying it how you are projecting it and accordingly you know does end the, the the whole solution you know and i think uh, building upon that nishit uh, you know th- that was on the experience side of it as you mentioned but i drove cars in uk recently last year you know there were driver alert system if if you are you know crossing over the lanes without blinking you know uh, there there you you get a sting kind of a thing while in, in your in your steering wheel right you so i think turning, it's your turning lights on is it yes without oh. turning right if you're crisscrossing your you know lanes without giving the signals you know there the 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 uh, there is a sting kind of a thing that you kind of feel uh, which kind of wakes you up you know because it assumes that you are kind of sleeping on the wheel mm-hmm. so it, there there are a lot of uh, uh, so there are sensors which are going to count your uh, uh, eyelid you know while you are uh, driving right and if it's the the rate of your blinking is unusual what you have been fed into the system right so it starts looking at um, you know it it either beeps you or it gives you some indicator uh, okay you know you 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 get back into your business right now because you are dozing off or something like that right so i think uh, uh, similarly yeah. the the wipers kind of get on if if it starts raining right uh the 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 lights turn on when you are crossing through a tunnel right so i don't have to turn on the uh, lights if it's if it's black because it sense that the the amount of light it needs to get in uh, is dropping because i'm entering the tunnel right so it automatically turns on and and then uh, it it's important because many times i have seen people uh, you know dri- driving from uh, uh, mumbai to pune because there are two to three tunnels right so by the time they are here and they forget to turn off the light right so uh, next morning they said can you help me with the jump start is like what happened oh i forgot to turn off my uh, uh, light uh, you know headlight 
yeah, yesterday evening, right? Because at the time when you are here, it's still like four or five in the evening. So you 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 don't remember to turn off them because it's not dark enough, right? So uh, how do you do all of this through the sensors, right? And then uh, process that data and then the actuators would take up the action part of it, when to turn on, when to turn off, you know, the wipers based on the, it's, is it actual rain or it is not the actual rain kind of thing? You know, so I think there's a lot of uh, uh, interconnectedness that is going to come up as, as we move forward, right? In the Absolutely. So, yeah. Just, so, just so, one point, if I, I may touch upon. So there are two types of things that uh, that is there. One is we are talking about ADAS, Advanced mm -hmm. Driver Assistant System. And then next level of ADAS goes into autonomous. So this is mostly happens at the edge computing level, like in vehicle, right? Whatever are the sensors are sending data, data with prefed uh, neural networks, you are processing that information, you are making a decision. So all uh, these are, there are uh, five ADAS levels through which we do it. What I want to touch upon, and that's also the topic part of it, the connected vehicle, what, what, is the, what is the difference between an ADAS autonomous and connected, right? Now, when we say connected, what happens is, that it has to connect with something and how is that happening? And uh, Anishit San talked about it, that uh, I can tell you beforehand, you are going there, that there is something. So there is an internet part of it that is coming into the play. So there is a chip that we put it, a telematics device we call it, and that we put that collects the data from entire ECUs, the, the ones, the data parameters that we want, and that is sent through your uh, mobile network to the servers. There, this whole data is getting processed. And through that, and there, it is the advanced AI, machine learning, data mapping, data matching, all those things are getting done. Now, based on that, there are so many use cases come to life. And when it is coming, you I'm connecting you to the world, external world from the car. And your car to the, uh, you, the, the extension of personality also is taking place, right? So here is the new dimension altogether comes in. Now, one is two parts are happening. One is compute is happening in the cloud and the message is relayed back. So you're, you are driving the car and we are getting all the parameters. All those are judged and with that we will generate how did you drive? How was your behavior in this trip? Right, so driver behaviors. And people are talking about this could be a fantastic thing to reduce your premiums while you go for insurance because you are a safe driver, right? Mm -hmm. And you're sitting in your office or you, you parked uh, your vehicle somewhere right? Not in the allocated parking lot. Now, suddenly on your mobile, you get an alert, your vehicle is moving. Now your vehicle is moving because somebody has broken to the car or it is getting towed away. Now, two situations are entirely different and you will take two very different kind of actions for that. Now, all this is possible because all this technology is available as a package within the car. But getting that data, interpreting that data and giving you an alert because your car is tilted, say, at 30 degree. Right? The that is the data coming towed. in. Yeah, it is being told. But if it is moving without being at tilt, it means somebody has started driving. And if you have a teenage uh, son, an adult, I would say, not pre-adult, who has got the driving license and you have given the car and the person is driving and you don't want him to move out of a particular range or you want to be alerted if it is moving out, yeah, you can set that parameter on the app and say, this is where if you move out of it, I get a notification and then I can at least talk to you <laughs> Dear, where are you and what? So all these things are made possible when all we these, have already connected. available. All these yeah, already... yeah, yeah, yeah. Suzuki Connect, for that matter of fact, which this is one pioneered and I pioneered in Suzuki. Honda Connect, all these things are available. 
there are a host of features which you can operate even i think now uh, uh hyundai is also having a uh, lot of features so all these features are now available and they are, you can so you want to uh, uh, you're not sure whether you're like Mo, dr mohit just said it my car's lights are switched on or off we forget now if you uh, you can look at it your mobile app and it will show you your lights are on and you can switch it off from there <laughs> from the mobile phone you can switch it off and you like they say in the morning you don't want to sit in a stuffy car though despite perfumes and all that we get because okay. a lot of uh, all right uh, you say okay i'm walking uh, i'm uh, starting from my place but i will be in the lift like 3 4 minutes i will have but let me uh, bring down the the uh, my glasses so that fresh air goes in i can do that from my mobile so by the time i'm reaching there yes everything is as as i so all this is possible in the on the vehicle sensors their responses and beyond the vehicle you do complex uh, computations and complex uh, uh, calculations and then you bring that results out and share it with people yeah okay sorry uh, uh, dr mohit uh, maybe you can help us understand uh, what do these changes in automotive engineering mean for youngsters who want to who want to get into the space how is the curriculum changing what are newer areas that youngsters need to understand understand especially to you know design all these fascinating use cases we've been hearing about so well, thank you for that question it's a wonderful question and it's it's my favorite interest area of how do you enable these youngsters to look for these new changes because unfortunately somebody thought that it's high time for the country to have a new education policy and it took 34 years in the country to have somebody think about it right now now that it has happened after 4 years we are still trying to figure out heads and tails of this new education policy having said that let's spark that question what would be the new age university new age learning should be right it is what we were looking at about what uh, anurag ji was referring about can we create these as incubators can we create these as accelerators can we talk about uh, training our kids to be a problem solvers rather than learning the things you know universities are the only animal that has not changed despite the entire humanity has evolved or evolutionized right we still do the chalk and talk kind of a stuff and the ppts have taken over but the ppts are still available right i'm saying the information sharing role of the faculty is now going to go away right the best support that we can give is to bring on industry to bring on multiple type of industries for example if i'm doing a two four year engineering course can i do the fundamental knowledge sharing with the students in let's say first two years right because he has come from after 12 he has not understood the university education system and so on and so forth so i take two years to equip him with all the theoretical knowledge again that too by doing a lot of hackathons by you know giving the problem statements and so on and so forth right but after two year can i send them to an oem for example we're talking about the you know the transportation part of it right can i send them to an oem let's say nishit takes over for that one year whatever you have learned as theory can i train these guys on hardware can i train them on the design side of it can i train them of things how do you do the market analysis how do you talk to the customers how do you size the customer right? you know the the market right you know uh, when we talk about these things most of our engineers most of our designers they don't understand all of these levers because they have never worked closely with the industry that's one year in the final year so so after third year they have worked with the hardware industry they come back the next year we send them to cap gemini it's a software company right then they start adding these layers of software with whether it is gen ai whether it is the designing side of it whether it is all of that cloud or edge computing so on and so forth right i think it's going to be a, a, a humongous task as a as a as a triple helix I, i call them you know between a corporate academia and the government right how do you uh, uh, raise this overall education system uh, you know together jointly to make these uh, youngsters look for that uh, another aspect on that is beyond teaching learning right uh, what we are looking at the higher education system is around 4 crore total student base in this country right uh, school education is around 30 crore the the gross enrollment ratio is around you know uh, uh, 17 18 19 20% right the government wants to double it what does it mean can you create enough universities in a brick mortar fashion 
to handle this kind of incoming student base. No, it, it has to be in the virtual digital university formats, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, many of them have to take up entrepreneurship as a career choice, right? Uh, the OEMs, the big companies who work on a quarter se quarter kind of a language, you know, the startups have to start using this different language of very nimble, very agile, uh, and I gave this, those two to three examples because we are talking about the transportation as a vehicle, as an engine, right? We spoke about the e-plane company, which is incubated at IIT Chennai. You know, they are talking about creating a personalized e-plane, you know, kind of flying taxi, right? There was another uh, startup, Idea Forge, which was into the surveillance of the, the you know, the borders and, and the defense, actually, Ministry of Defense opened up their sector. They allowed the uh, startups to come in, right? Uh, the similar uh, uh, example is recently, last week, it was India's first 3D printed uh, rocket uh, that went up in the space. Agnikul is a, a startup, right? So I think while the big companies would be there to play that big role of OEMs and you know build these big markets or serve the big markets, there is this element that India has been ignited upon, something called startups. Who will be doing these startups? These are the young guys, right, 18 to 25, because they have the runway to fail multiple times, come back again, and then again do the new startup, right? All of us who are sitting in the, uh, you know, the, the webinar, who are probably 40 plus, 45 plus, we don't really have the runway to run this marathon of 10 years, 20, you know, 15 years, right? So we as have to play a bigger role of being the mentors. These youngsters have phenomenal access to the technology. They have phenomenally power of, you know, energy. We need to uh, tame this energy in the right direction create many of these startups who are going to change the face of the world and work with these big uh, uh, you know OEMs who are going to take these young solutions to the world over right it's 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 created in india but can be sold to the world right it's it's not just made in india we will we'll create solutions here but they need to be sold out to the world and these youngsters can only create solutions and the OEMs will have to probably play up that you know uh, uh, ambidextrous role of some startups and then taking these solutions from india to the global world. So I think I'll stop you there. You but... that OEMs will do more? They're not entirely happy with what they do right now? Well, well, they are forced right now, let me say that. I, I'm, I'm not leaving it for the for the guests. All of them have to, you know, their focus is on increasing sales. Their focus is on capturing more market. But if you don't build innovation, if and, you know somebody mentioned about the research, if, we, if our universities don't do enough research, if we don't create the, you know, IPR-led innovation, IPR-led startups, right? And if they do, if the bigger uh, OEMs, they don't acquire these new solutions, right? What would be the new value that they are going to offer at a reduced price? It's, it's also that, you know, we, we have to create these new products, new services, but at the reduced price. And that is where our advantage of India comes into play. We can create solutions which can be sold world over at the cheapest possible price in the world. Nishit, you agree with that? Uh, with permission uh, of Dr. Mohit, uh, uh, if I may add <laughs> something. <laughs> So, uh, see, a lot of engagements and, and this exactly this point is valid and uh, it has to be taken care for sure. But a lot of engagements has also happened. It's not that uh, industry is not working on it. Uh, so, look at this SAE, the Society of Automobile Engineers, right? So they are actively, you know, promoting all these things through some events and in fact, they're uh, encouraging students to, you know, uh, come up with some prototypes, some concepts, which they even run some contests, right? Uh, from industry perspective, there are a lot of internships which are happening. There are a lot of, you know, the, the training efforts which are going from the industry side. So, so of course, uh, we can say that uh, it may take some time actually to come into the right chair, but initiatives have already started going. Uh, the other thing, I, other comment I have is, and uh, this, this is based on my experience. So, see, see, we are very busy in, you know, differentiating or drawing a line between hardware and software. Right, but we don't talk about product as a whole, and that's where uh, our biggest, you know, uh, the perspective, and and that that's a perspective changer because the moment you start talking about a product itself, it combines both hardware and software, and then you think in that direction. Currently, what is happening is uh, pe some people are comfortable in the software, so they'll stick to their software mentality, which of course may or may not be feasible when you realize a product, the real hardware, and vice versa. So, so, so we have to break this barrier first of all. That okay, there is a hardware industry, there is a software industry. It's not that there, there is a product which needs to go. There is an innovation which needs to be taken care of. Right now, who, how it has to be done is a different thing. What kind of skills you need for bringing those innovations are different. But yeah, that so barrier and that add, mental. Yeah, no, no. I, I think uh, uh, you know those, those inputs are very valid. But let me throw some numbers. 
the total R&D spend of the country is around 0.8% of the GDP. 0.6% comes from government. It's only 0.2% that is coming from the corporate. You compare it with anywhere in the world, right? How do you enable them without the heaviest funding that is going to come in from the uh, industry, right? I mean, all these small interventions are good, but we are talking about about four crore people, right? If, if we don't provide them with the relevant hardware infrastructure, right? Who will provide that? It has to be industry. You, you spoke about the mentoring part of it, right? So it has to come from industry. How often do you see, and I'm pretty sure we all of us go to a lot of campuses, how many uh, faculties are being upgraded uh, uh, in the private space? Because 70, 80% of our students are going to private universities, private colleges, out of this overall space, right? So uh, if, if we don't bring industries to invest in that, through different vehicles, right? The foundation, family offices, you know, the the, the cross-border funding. And that's why there's this new launch of National, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Research Foundation, right? 100 lakh, uh, 100,000 crore uh, investment is being planned to, you know, supercharge that uh, 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 research efforts, right? I think, uh, uh, you know, we, we spoke about data analytics was the old ways of how do you analyze things. But when AI and the Gen AI, uh, came in, they supercharged that trajectory, right? So I think uh, uh, once we add the corporate layer uh, in, in a, a massive volume, it would supercharge all your efforts in the R&D, uh, and you will have a lot of these startups solving these very, very difficult problems. And then the, prop, the, then the psyche of uh, thinking through the overall as a product will start coming in uh, for a lot of these guys. On this, I take little anthropological uh, uh, view and uh, how it happened within this. So I'm a I'm a youngster who 80s, 90s, who did colleging and then came into this. Now, what I saw at that time of uh, the time, the computer or computer revolution started. Uh, then we had the companies like Infosys coming up, startup, we a few hundred millions from there and the journey because they were growing with us. Like for me and all of us, but I, I related, I was growing up with them and those numbers slowly started growing. And I, I had a hypothesis, which I used to call here, the capital cost is very low in IT. You buy a computer, probably at those days in nineties with uh, some uh, few KBs of RAM, it used to call 96,000, 100,000 rupees, right? One computer. For, Compared to hundreds of crores of investment, it was much, much cheaper. And that is where our true human intelligence or the, the way we say the, the uh, uh, as Prime Minister often talks about our demographic dividend, it started playing. It gave confidence to the country that yes, we are talented people. We have talented people and we can do, we can work hard and we can do miracles. Is the next wave came in where the entrepreneurs, the business houses had built the trust. If this can happen in IT, it can happen in manufacturing as well. And that is where that virtuous cycle started, people started. So they first they manufactured and sold the product. Now they are saying we are of a size. If we have to maintain this size, we have to retain this size, now innovation is not a choice, not an option for them. It is a survival instinct. All the big corporates, manufacturing houses, if they, the size they have attained, if they want to retain it also, they have to innovate. Otherwise they will just collapse. And now as uh, uh, Dr. Mohit was saying, the, the, those funds have been set at the national level. Now more and more people are realizing that this is the cutting edge. Manufacturing facilities can be done. Somebody else can also create with deep pockets, but wait, how will I survive? And that is when survival attitude comes in, where you say, I'm not safe at my current position. And hence I have to look for, I have to tap into talent. I have to put money, not put money for uh, my generosity sake or as philanthropy, but I'm putting money because I have to survive. And when that existential threat comes in, then this is where 
uh, your innovation starts that's where your research starts that where you say that's what my 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 hypothesis i am not questioning it i i think that way no, so I, I think to... let me let me add there two two very relevant points uh -huh. to this whole thing i mean all yeah. the entire uh, uh, automobile industry right for example it, it depends upon chip right yeah uh -huh. the supply chain when it was broken everybody was a standstill and that's where the government started this national semiconductor mission that we still today we don't have any fab labs here so the fab facility is being now promoted to go forward right now if we are betting big on uh, india ai mission for example right we we do we have all the gpus that are required we don't probably have it right so we the investment has to be done on the infrastructure before some innovators can come in and then start building their solutions on top of it so it's a mix of hardware plus software, as Nishit was rightly mentioning. Okay. Uh, but unless until we do have a hardware, right? You know, of the GPUs, how can I build a layer of AI? Right? Okay. If I don't have chips, how can I build the sensors? <laughs> so I think it's it's a it's a glove in hand kind of a situation. But it's probably right time that we, we have started a lot of these uh, you know uh, uh, intervention. And hopefully, uh, when our next generation would be doing this uh, webinar after twenty years. They will not be figuring it out as a two different <laughs> entities of a hardware and a software. They'll uh, probably be talking about the Nishit's point. It's a product. It's a commute product that they are talking about and not a hardware plus software thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, inter very interesting discussion. Uh, I just want to end. I mean, we don't have much time left, but uh, quickly, I mean, uh, given the kind of impact software is making, and we, we were discussing it the other day, uh, the kind of newer business models that might emerge now, uh, with all these connected cars, uh, a lot of the money will probably come in the after the car is bought. Is it a lot of upgradation of software, newer services being provided? All of that is that uh, the way that you see uh, car companies going? Nishit, you want to? Yeah, maybe I can start quickly. Uh, so, uh, so uh, here what we need to understand first of all, it's uh, see, of course, it. it appears to be a very lucrative business, mm -hmm. especially for OEMs. Uh, and uh, that's why a lot of people are building or uh, working on it. However, I want to bring one perspective here. It's not only about business. It's about how you add value to customer. And if you're not able to add value to customer, no matter what, you'll not be able to earn anything out of it. But the moment you add, uh, uh, start adding value, whether in terms of the business operations or in terms of personal experience or whatever, there you can actually start. And it's a co-creation. It's not a. It's a. It's not a one-way uh, uh, demonstration of a product. It's a co-creation at which you have to do, and we have to do together with the customer. So, so the unless I I start churning out the value, I, I start providing the value to the consumer. Uh, there is no business, right? Even if I spend multi crores, it's not going to help me. Right, and that's where the perspective is that see, it's even if you in any business, it's not only about the software or the hardware or the automobile. The, unless I'm focusing on the user experience, I'm focusing on the value, I'm focusing on the safety, I'm focusing on the efficiencies, and if I'm able to justify with my solution, of course, yes, I'm in a commanding position. But the moment I'm not able to do it, uh, game over. Okay, you're saying consumers themselves will want these upgradations and all that over. Uh... I mean, uh, software upgrades and all of that because the vehicle itself is becoming safer, better. Exactly. I mean, it's like you can, uh, I mean, I can give you an example and an analogy like we have this OTT, right? Hmm. Uh, Netflix or uh, Prime videos or whatever. See, will you pay for it unless you, unlike, unless you like it? Absolutely. Probably no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? The, but the moment you start liking it, you will definitely pay for it. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where the whole perspective changes. So it's not a push or it's not a, a vision which OEM has to carry. It's a co-creation activity which we have to do together with consumers. Yeah. yeah Wonderful. You know, I think uh, what, what Nishit was mentioning is about the freemium models of things, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of throw in something for people and then they start liking it and then they mm. are, you kind of try to withdraw that. Uh, uh, people are skeptical that it's going to impact my life, right? And then they are saying, okay, you charge me this, but I'm going to, you know, willing to pay this and I'll still utilize these services, right? But when you uh, speak about the different types of business models that will start kicking in. Uh, I think we have to slice and dice this entire value chain of the uh, mm. uh, industry, right? Uh, can I create something as a personalization, as a service, right at the time of designing the vehicle, right? 
can I order my vehicle, which is uh, uh, specific to my size of things because I'm 5'2", my wife drives it, if it has to be, you know, for my person with physical disability because I am 60 years plus, irrespective of it is 18 years old who's driving or 70 year old who's driving, it is still the same vehicle. Can we get into that space? So that space would give the OEMs a lever to sell this as a differentiated service where they say you can customize your vehicle, right? Absolutely. Not whole lot, but still very, very, uh, 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 you know, smaller pieces where can, you can still feel the comfort that, oh, this is my personal vehicle. There's not a generic mass all catch all kind of a thing. It is still my personal vehicle that has been made to order at the cheapest price possible, right? If you go on to customize, I still remember that rut of, uh, you know, uh, Advani Ji, which was the costliest customization that happened or the Dilip Chavalia did it, right? Can we bring that, bring down that cost of customization for the customers using these technologies? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible now, right? Then you uh, uh, get into the, uh, the, the hardware side of things where the best innovation that has happened so far is the rental model, right? Uh, how do you rent these uh, vehicles? Uh, that's the... Uh, uh, the code that has been cracked, right? But beyond rental model, there are many opportunities that will come up, right? Can I hire the mechanic? You know, those are things that are coming up, right? Uh, it's like a AAA service in US, right? Can I get my mechanic on demand on call, right? Uh, Nishit also mentioned about uh, the OTD platforms and, and it's, it's video on demand. Can I get a lot of these services on demand? For example, can I sell my, or it's, it's also an opportunity of cross-selling. You know, as a hardware vendor, as an OEM, I start partnering with a lot of pizza delivery guys, you know, a lot of these services, which are saying, oh, you can order it right from here because you know at 6 p.m. you you feel hungry, right? What are the choices that I have? Can I click on a button? Can I say, oh, I need a coffee, right? I don't have to think through this because it's, it's an intelligence that is being baked into my system. There are a lot of cross-building, cross-selling kind of an opportunity that will start coming up, right? So I think as we, as the, as the industry evolves, uh, the, the market would take care of it regarding the business model because these youngsters will know how to make money. And, okay. and uh, they, they are much more intelligent of, uh, you know, uh, uh, creating these small chotu chotu elements which can be sold as an individual, you know, chota packet, bada dhamaka kind of a thing, uh, which OEMs will take a whole lot of time to even think through this. So I, I'm very excited about the various yeah, business models that are going to unfold. Absolutely. It's a great note to end on. I mean, a very new world emerging in the automobile sector. And as Anurag said at the beginning, it's something that affects all of us. It's not like a pilot who's using an aero, piloting an aeroplane or a locomotive driver. It impacts every one of us. And uh, the car is getting more and more personalized, uh, as uh, Moit just said. Uh, and every part is being affected, impacted by software. And of course, like all of you said, it's not just software. You have to combine software and hardware. It's the combination which is really driving it all. And we're going to see a very exciting future. Th thanks to all of you, Anurag, Dr. Mohit, Nishit, for joining us on this platform. Really nice having you. Hope to see you again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Nishit. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.